the Lord has, in his providence, allowed the difficulties and all of that in my life and their life in some part, hopefully to bring redemption in their life, but certain redemption in my life. Welcome to This Whole Life, a podcast for all of us seeking sanity and sanctity, and a place to find joy and meaning through the integration of faith and mental health. I'm Pat Millay, a Catholic speaker, musician, and leader, and I'm happy to bring you this podcast along with my bride, Kenna, a licensed marriage and family therapist. This is the stuff she and I talk about all the time, doing dishes, in the car, on a date. We're excited to bring you this podcast for educational purposes. It's not therapy or a substitute for mental health care. So come on in, have a seat at our dining room table, and join the conversation with us. We are so glad you're here. Welcome back to This Whole Life, friends. We are seeking sanity and sanctity one episode at a time. Good day to you out there, good listener, wherever you find yourself. And uh, by good day, I mean good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, uh, on a plane, on a boat. I don't know where you find yourself today, but we hope it's a great day wherever you are. And we are so excited for today's episode and to share it with you. Um, before we get into that, though, we uh, we would love for you to uh, offer a rating and a review on whatever podcast app you use to listen to This Whole Life and uh, we'd love for you to follow us along on uh, social media at This Whole Life Podcast or to visit us at thiswholelifepodcast.com. We, we love the interaction. We love hearing from our good listeners and uh, learning more and more how we can serve you well through this whole life. Um, so if you would take a few seconds just to rate and review, that would really help us and it would help folks have access to this whole life. So thanks in advance. Friends, we cannot be more excited about the conversation that we have in store for you today. Our guest today is Ryan O'Hara. Uh, Ryan serves as the marketing strategist for St. Paul's Outreach, a national Catholic organization that ministers to college students on campus. And he's just so passionate about seeing Catholics come alive in Christ, to grow in spiritual maturity, to become apostles to the people in their life. Um, He graduated from William Jewell College, and then I got to know Ryan when he was uh, finishing his master's degree in theology at the University of Notre Dame. That's how we first met. Uh, But more important for our conversation today, he and his lovely wife, Jill, live here in West St. Paul, Minnesota, and they are parents to four fantastic boys, and we're so excited to have him with us today. Ryan, welcome. How are you? It's great to be here. I'm doing great. Good to have you. Good to have you. Thanks for uh, joining us in the old podcast studio up in Malay Manor. Appreciate it. it. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Ryan's, uh, we've been good friends for a long time. We'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, uh, I guess there's no need to wait. We've been good friends for a long time. It's been great. We met at uh, Notre Dame years ago. You were pursuing a master's degree. I was doing the same. We ended up in a lot of classes together. And um, you were one of the the very friendly people that weren't in my specific graduate program <laughs> who had the the courage and the grace to just say hi and like <laughs> communicate with people that you didn't know. So thank you for doing that. I'm You're glad welcome. We got You're connected welcome. back then. <laughs> my, uh, my campus ministry background and calling uh, maybe prepared me for that, but... That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, Find a college student those, and just right. say hi. Yeah. That's right. I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad you did. Yeah. We had lots of good old days of Ultimate Frisbee back then. And now more than anything, I just see you at church sometimes, which is uh, a great grace as well. So <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it's great to have you with us as our honored guest. Would you like to kick us off with our highs and hards this yeah. week, my man? Yeah, you bet. Um, just when when you asked you know, that question, as I, as I kind of came to kind of reflect on on this season that I've been in, uh, it's been, um, a a pretty challenging one actually over the last, um, all of most of 2022, but then kind of the end of 2022, both my stepdad, um, he died in late 2022 after almost a year long battle with cancer. Mm. And I was his primary, uh, caregiver. He lives just, or he lived just about a mile from me. And, um, and then also then about six weeks later, uh, my wife's dad died. Oh wow! And that was a more of a sudden, sudden thing. He had a he had a history of some some heart disease, but it happened 
just like that wow. and a massive heart attack. And an hour later he died. And so there was, um, in both of those instances, there was, there were unique graces. So I would say that, that was hard. Like that was a, a really hard thing to experience both uh, through the, the grueling experience of, of kind of accompanying someone through a cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the, the treatment is, is, is worse than the disease, as right. they say. And yeah. that probably was perhaps the case for him. And, um, and so, but then um, that was one experience of, of loss and, and, and pain and, and difficulty, but also um, Jill's dad, just, uh, you know, it just, we just get the call and, and you kind of know that, you know, when you get the call or you see someone else getting the call, you know, something's not right. Yeah. And, and so um, that, that those were both really um, difficult losses there um, at the end of the year. But the, but I also through that whole thing uh, there, if I could, I'll do kind of one and a half highs. That's allowed. Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's allowed. <laughs> the, um, the first thought that I experienced that whole part of accompanying my stepdad through this was I would never have, have wished what he experienced through, through cancer on anyone but I would wish what I experienced as a caregiver on everyone. Hmm. And I learned so much about what parenting and that relationship looks like as it sort of shifts over time. Sure. The honor and privilege to accompany him through this really dark experience. And part of the, the context is my mom is still alive, but she has dementia. So she was in a memory care unit. Oh, wow. Probably the hardest thing was even after the fact, after he died, it hit me that he never received any consolation from his wife, sure. who he continued to visit daily in her memory care unit, and she couldn't in any way offer any consolation. Mm. And boy, did that just really hit me. What a, what a profound suffering that was for him, in yeah. addition to the physical suffering. But, but, but to be able to be so up close and personal to a person preparing uh, for death was was such an honor. And my experience in both um, watching that and preparing for the funeral and and going through going through all of that as well as my father-in-law's passing and subsequent funeral and burial, I, I thought the church knows what she's doing <laughs> to pray for and bury the dead. Yeah, it was so remarkable to watch the church do what the church do, does best, mm -hmm. and of course, the church does thousands of things beautifully. But if if it was only just this, <laughs> I, I, it almost felt like that might almost be enough. It's not, you yeah, know? yeah. But boy, was that a consolation to watch the church's liturgy unfold, and you can just get you just get kind of wrapped up into it. And I, I so I just walked away with such. A, a profound appreciation for the gift of the church's liturgy, particularly around how the church prays for and commends the dead uh, to to the Lord. And there is such grace, such consolation in that. And so I walked away from that experience with, with you know, that was really, really hard, uh, but these profound highs mm. uh, through through the end of last year. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's You're welcome. That's incredible. Yeah. That's that sounds like a really difficult end of last year. And maybe some sounds like some unexpected graces that came in the midst of suffering and hardship even through that as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That think, was uh, that was exactly it. And I think in some ways kind of encapsulates the 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 paradox of the cross and the paradox mm, of the mm -hmm. Christian life. And I again I it was hard. It was hard to experience, and yet I, I will treasure those experiences of the last year for the rest of my life. I think. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah, makes me think about a lot of the things we talked about a few episodes ago in our grief episode, yeah. just about the the different experiences of grief, coming at grief from different directions, and that it shows up sometimes in unexpected ways, but it also often brings unexpected gifts with it as well. That kind of clarify and reveal the love that we have for these people or this situation that maybe would, wouldn't have known without I the know. grief in the first place. That's you know, right. it's a, it's a strange mystery, it but, is. uh, but beautiful too. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think my high lately was, um, we've got 
a number of children, as you out there listening well know, uh, and our children are starting to get into the age where they're doing like sports and activities and things like that. I love sports. I think sports are really valuable, <laughs> whether or not you ever get a D1 scholarship. And I have no illusion that any of our kids ever will. I'd actually maybe prefer that they don't, frankly. But uh, if even if they don't, super valuable for like uh, coordination with a team, hard work, discipline, things like that, right? Which all of our kids and myself can really stand to grow in, you know? Um, but I just, I, I, I don't buy into the vibe of it being like your end all be all necessarily, but our older few kids are starting to get engaged with like football and basketball. And now we've got Mm. two boys that are wrestling now. Mm. And it just, it's so fun to see them struggle in ways that are controlled and relatively safe. You know, like, uh, our, our 10 year old son, uh, had a wrestling tournament recently and, uh, he had a really hard match and he lost. And he fought his tail off. Mm. It was just tenacious. Yeah. He went up against a really like evenly matched kid. They were both the same weight, so it was fair. But this other kid was just really skilled. He was very good. And he had to... It, it's been interesting and good navigating the disappointment of losing and also our pride in his effort even in the loss. You know, right. like trying to hold those two things together has been yeah. a real high to kind of navigate that journey with kids who just want to win every match, you know. Um, so that's been a real high. I think um, the hard uh, also, as our kids get older, not only do they have more sports and activities, we're learning they also have more emotions and hormones. So we're, <laughs> we're like <laughs> inching <laughs> ir- irrevocably toward <laughs> middle school and that whole time period. Right. So we're just getting early glimpses of like, oh, boy. <laughs> and I was a youth minister. I am very comfortable with high school hormones and and relationships and emotions and mood swings i get all that but in my home yep. it feels different right like what's the phrase like it hits different when it's my kid when it's someone else's kid and i deal with it for an hour and a half and i send him home not much of a problem when it's my kid and all of a sudden my value is caught up in their experience somehow Number one, I need to learn better differentiation. Number two, I need to learn how to support my kids when they're having a bad day Mm. in a more patient way than I probably do right now. So it's a fun, hard experience, which you well know. So I do. Middle school (laughs) was a turning point. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, I and I didn't really anticipate it as much in that way uh, because it wasn't as much for for me growing up, um, but for my boys. something happened like in the middle of fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. And <laughs> right. I'm like, who are you? Yeah, right. so, you know. <laughs> what monster yeah. took over your body? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing your high and hard and uh, for, for being here with us as well. Great to be um, here. So uh, one of the main reasons that I'm excited to talk to you specifically, Ryan, is about your and your wife's experience with the way has God led you into family life yeah. and how you've experienced your particular family's particular joys and struggles in the midst of this call that you've received, right? Which is similar to others out there listening probably in some ways, and obviously just very particular to your circumstances in some ways too. So um, for the sake of background, maybe can you just give us a little glimpse into like how you and Jill met, uh, how the relationship started off? What, How did things kind of start off for you guys? Well, uh, we I always like to to reminisce that the first two words that Jill said to me were, I do. (laughs) Kind of like the the wedding vow of I do. And uh, we were playing a, uh, I was a a new campus minister at the University of Missouri Newman Center. Mm -hmm. And I see this this beautiful young woman across the way at this sort of uh, teen, like life teen event. And I was there to just kind of help out. I was working with the college students and this was a high school event and we were playing like one of those like uh bingo games where you're like trying to find the people yeah, you know right, who right. who have done these different things and i and one of them was run 10 miles a week and so i just shouted out loud does anybody around here run 10 miles a week and she says i do okay foreshadowing anyway it's foreshadowing perfect, yeah. it was that's right <laughs> and uh and i was just so glad when i met her that she wasn't a high school student <laughs> and she wasn't a college student she looked because she looked young in fact we were the same age i'm like score because i'm a new campus minister and, and that's important so, yes correct uh, right <laughs> so we we hit it off uh right away um 
and a year. So she was uh, she was getting her master's degree in education, and I was a uh, the campus minister. And the thing that really drew us together is we were kind of the 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 two. I use this term loosely, sort of evangelical Catholics. Sure, we both experienced conversion um, in college, but kind of outside of the Catholic Church. And for me, it was at a I was at a um, a Baptist liberal arts college, and she was at University of Missouri and got involved with Crusade. Sure, but we both landed back in the church, and uh, but still had this sort of vibrant sense of a faith, a relationship with Jesus, and a real desire for mission. And that was really what kind of drew us together. Mm. And a year and a half later, uh, we were we were married, and 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 really from the days that we were just first meeting to even still literally this weekend right now we're we're praying about god where where do you want to send us in terms of who are the people that we're reaching out to what's the mission you've called us to that's just been a kind of a mantra for all these years and now you know let's see uh we just celebrated um 24 years. So, awesome. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations, yeah. man. Yeah. Inching up on 25. We no are. kidding. Yeah. Oh, 25 years of mission. I love that. That's right. Yeah. And I love the, the, that kind of perspective, too, of not just the very clear common mission of building this family and right. your own domestic church, but a kind of outward looking mission as well, that, that your marriage exists partially to serve the church and the world outside of yourselves as well, that it's not this insulated little experience of God's grace, but it's meant to be shared and given. Yeah. 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 In that. fact, I we were uh, at one of these sort of teen events that summer. Uh, we were in kind of a prayer circle and, you know, you kind of go around and the different core members share their prayer and teenagers share their prayer. And it was kind of like, you know, just normal kind of nothing too great, just normal kind of prayers, praying for this, praying for that. But when Jill prayed, I was like, who I just loved her heart. I loved yeah. the way that she she talked to God as if God was real, and there was this real boldness and uh, that came out of that prayer, and that was really what what sparked you know this sense of God. You know, this this is exactly who I would want to to link up with. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. absolutely. I love that. Thanks for thanks for the background there. That's yeah. beautiful. I yeah. love that. So so married after a year and a half. You know, grateful she wasn't a high schooler. She wasn't even a college student. So it headed toward the altar and this beautiful family was formed. Um, uh, Down the road, you know, you've been doing mission work and work in evangelization through your entire family life. Um, At what point uh, did the discernment process about fostering adoption, about growing your family in that particular way, at what point did that become part of the conversation or part of the prayer for you too? Yeah. Interestingly enough, we discerned a call um, the summer. So we were married in the fall of 98, the summer of 98, I'm sorry, summer of 2000. So a year and a half later, we, we were, we wanted to go on some kind of mission training thing. And we were searching all over, where could a married couple go be trained as Catholic missionaries? Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. SPO wasn't going to take us. Focus was just getting started. And that was for kind of more singles and same with net. And we found this thing in Wellington, New Zealand, that would welcome singles or, or married couples who are Catholic to be trained in, in mission and evangelization. We're like, that's it. We want to do that. But what we had to do was to go to go get a, a physical, you know, and to get checked up. And sure. all of that. And it was through that experience that we discovered um, that it was going to be difficult to get pregnant mm. and that infertility was likely we, – we were trying and open to life from from day one and it, and it wasn't happening. So we had a sense. And so ironically, it was kind of because of this kind of call to mission that God also brought the clarity around, you know, this is going to be tough. And – um and so it was really in the midst of of that reality uh, for for us as a married couple, this diagnosis of infertility, that we remembered, you know, on our wedding day, like all Catholic married couples, we 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 promised to be open to life and to welcome children. Right. And um, we said, well, it it may not happen the way it happens for for many, but we really do want to be open to it actively, and so pursue it. And so we looked at at. Um, you know, private adoption. We looked at mm-hmm. international adoption. In fact, we went on a mission a couple of years later with a group of young adults to um, 
to a border town in Mexi- uh, border town in Mexico, Agua Prieta, and we we went to a number of like different places. One of which was an orphanage, and and if Jill could have like smuggled three or four yeah, kids right. under her jacket, <laughs> she would have. You know, it was just so beautiful to see her heart, her motherly heart, kind mm. of light up. But but we discerned the discernment was you know where is it where people aren't lining up to adopt. Hmm. Um, where is it where there might be a child who, who might end up not getting adopted? And, and, and we kind of then landed on, on foster care, hmm. that there's a, just a massive need. We were in Phoenix, Arizona at the time, mm-hmm. and um, the need was, was significant in Maricopa County. And so we said, well, let's go there. You know, there, there, <laughs> there isn't a, a, waiting, a waiting period. There isn't a, a line. Um, in fact, there's kids who, who may not end up uh, you know, finding a forever home. Sure. And so let's start there. And uh, thankfully, we had her parents' example of being um, foster parents. That was really my only. I didn't know. I, I, you know, I had all of these sort of misnomers. I think about foster care, mm-hmm. um, but thankfully, had a great example in her parents, and that really pushed us in that direction. That we would first kind of open our home to to kids uh, who who needed a home. Uh, temporarily, because the goal of foster parenting is is um, is reunification with birth families. Sure, but some of them um, can't reunify with their birth families, and so we were open to that too. That mm-hmm. we might kind of build a, a a family that way, and so that was you know kind of mid two thousands two thousand five when when that began. I remember our first. Our first, I always say, you know, most most parents have nine months to prepare, you know, for for a baby. We had nine miles, you know, and <laughs> we drove across town, and, and that was something else. I'll never forget it. Uh, little sweet little Jose um, was his name, and four months old, uh, and and welcomed him into our home, and that was the beginning of it. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm curious about. Um, you said that you know Jill had had at least grown up with an experience of what foster care can and ought to look like in in the context of a loving home and, and great foster parents. Um, and you came in with a little bit more just benign ignorance of just, yeah. I don't actually know what to expect here. You know, right. were there were there specific um, reservations or questions or things that you came into the process with uh, that got addressed right away or things that kind of um, had to be revealed or or spoken to over time? Yeah, I think I had a... I had a an improper understanding of why a child might be placed in foster care. Sure. I think I had a a very negative view of the child mm. versus a negative view of their circumstances. And so like, well, there's something wrong with this child. Mm. And and so that that was the first thing that I had to be dis, you know, had to had to had to change. Was no, there's 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 nothing wrong with the child. The child the child is a is a in a sense a product of these really difficult circumstances that sure. they didn't choose and that they really have no power over, and and so that was one thing. And the second thing was I didn't understand the goal of foster care. Mm. I would have thought of it more as just like a rescue mission, right? Um, and birth family bad. Uh, O'Hara family good, sure, you know, right, or something. <laughs> and and that's just not the case. Yeah. Um, it's so much more complex, so much different than that simple black and white kind of perspective. And so my heart started to to go out to our heart started to go out to the birth families mm. and to understand that even their circumstances have a history and a context, and it's not quite as simple as as we might like to make it. And so. Just a lot of, of of coming to understand the reality of of what brings a child into the foster care system, mm. um, and again, of course, you know, uh, to, to be to be to be placed in to be taken out of a home and to be placed in foster care, something pretty serious has to go down. Right, you know, right. this is abuse and neglect, and you know, an unhealthy or an unsafe, a truly unsafe place. Uh, for a child to be. So that's that's nothing to joke about, nothing, you know, nothing to hold lightly. But at the same time, um the 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 child is just being the child. And I 
I, I didn't understand why that they wouldn't have welcomed a, ha- a so-called happy or safe uh, place to be, that they'd rather be there. And so I had to really change my mind about what, what is the importance and value of, of, of becoming a foster parent is being committed to the good of families staying together mm-hmm. if it's possible. Mm-hmm. And that's a heavy duty work. Uh, because you have to to love as though they'll they'll always be with you, but hold it lightly so that so that you can let go when needed, and uh, that's a that's a challenge. And and you have to absorb, and I think be ready to absorb some of that pain and suffering. Right, right. That's just part of the deal. Yeah. And um, so there's just a lot that that my mind needed to understand differently. As I as I started doing it, sounds like a lot of really beautiful but tricky nuance of living in the discomfort of a situation that is imperfect, but is trying to find healing in a lot of different directions. You know that that um, that the role of a foster family is to be on the side of loving united families all over the place, right? So if 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 my role as a foster parent is to keep this child safe, healthy, and happy for a few months in order that they can go back to a safe, healthy, happy family, then that's my role, right? But then yeah. the other discomfort that you mentioned about, well, I have to love this kid with everything I've got, and I also be, I also have to be hopeful that they will leave. That's yes. actually the goal. That's the goal. You know, that's, that's, that's goal. fascinating and sounds really difficult, actually, to live in that place. It uh, It is, uh, and it was... And in some ways, um, I, I still experience the the challenge of that reality. Even so, we had, you know, over the span of three years, uh, when we were foster licensed foster parents in Maricopa County, two thousand five to two thousand eight, mm-hmm. we had thirteen kids come through our home, wow. and four of them stayed forever, mm-hmm. as we say. And um, of those four, three of them have some meaningful, even healthy contact with birth family. Uh, one of them does not. And I still see that longing mm. uh, in them, mm. in that one. And 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 actually there's a part of me that's like, it hurts a little bit even. Yeah. Like just to still see like, oh, that's not resolved. That that will be forever a question for him. And that's not true for every you know kid who's adopted through foster care or sure. adopted period, but but it is for him, and and really continuing to give him space to 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 grieve that, to to try to figure some of that out, and for it to impact even our relationship to this day, mm-hmm. and still see the it's not what God intended, you know, and so we're 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 a part of an unideal plan that God has for for say. Uh, parenthood, you know. Right. And right. and yet we're in it. We're willing to kind of be in in that mess um even though and it's it's not ideal, but there's there's needed resources there. I love that. I love that. And I want to come back to that idea of um some of the 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 needs and the struggles and the desires that come along with fostering and adoption from from the perspective of a child, from the perspective of yourself as a parent. Um so, so to get to that, to kind of tie the the sides of family and mental health together, yeah. I'm curious about what your maybe background or kind of understanding of mental health has been throughout your life. You know, as as you uh, seek to support the health of your family in every direction now, spiritual health, physical health, mental health, how has your understanding of mental health changed over the years? Yeah. So I would say I had uh, I've had two very different perspectives, one before foster care and one after. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm I'm dating myself here a little bit, but I was born in the 70s. I'm a child of the 80s. I went to high school in the early 90s in college. And I can count on, I mean, one hand, the number of people I knew in my life, say even pre-foster care. So Mm -hmm. almost the first 30 years of my life, uh, I can count on one hand the number of people I knew who maybe saw a therapist or right. um, were, were treating 
you know, uh, anxiety and depression, you know, with, with say medication or like th that just was not a normal part of my, my experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I had some thoughts about that. And I think I, I thought it's anyone who, who struggles with, with mental health is only the extreme and anybody else who says, says they do like there's, there's something that they're obviously not doing, that would be very simple. So just get your life together, pray more, <laughs> whatever, all of these sort of really simple things that sure. don't address the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And so I had that view very much um, kind of before foster care. And in foster care, I started to see the complexities of the human person much more up close and personal, mm -hmm. both in, both in my, my children and, and in their birth families and just starting to see, and I just hadn't seen it. And, and as I started to see it, um, I, my, my view about it shifted. I mean, we had, because, because you're a foster parent and uh, the state or the county is helping to support those families, there are all sorts of resources. Mm -hmm. And so we had access to a variety of therapists, uh, speech therapists and, and psychologists and counselors and all of that occupational therapists, all the whole thing. Right. And I started to understand those professions and I started to see the difference they were making in my kids' lives. And I started to see the difference they were making in my life. Hmm. And I thought, you know, I, and I, I, I had this thought continually. I think everyone would benefit from this kind of interaction I'm having on a regular basis. I'm growing so much as a person, as a, as a husband, as a father, just through my interactions with therapists just before and after my kid's appointment. Sure. How yeah. much more would I benefit if I had my own therapist? And, <laughs> you know, and, um, and so that just started to sort of break this sort of false belief I had, mm -hmm. a false understanding, and that, and that everyone, and what I started to see was that for all of us, uh, we're there's some degree of, of, of care around mental health that we all need. Mm -hmm. Some perhaps more, some perhaps a little less, but it's, it's a good. Yeah. Um, and it's not in opposition uh, to the good that spiritual health brings as well. Sure. They're not in competition with one another. Um, even though I think you might, you might say that um, those who go to you know receive the sacraments regularly and who might be in a, a group with other men or women to kind of talk about and share their lives or they they go to confession uh, regularly those can have great if you will therapeutic effects absolutely but it's not a replacement for the unique care and gifting uh, that someone is trained you know as a as a as a, a professional to help provide to a person that may need that support. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I see it as a good in that before maybe things get too far, you know, too difficult, you know, be a bit more, pre, you know, proactive in right. that. That's right. really what has shifted in my my mind and heart. Yeah, the way Kenna puts it oftentimes from her work as a marriage and family therapist is there's, there's kind of a, <laughs> people use the word statistics loosely sometimes, you know, like as a youth minister, we would throw around the quote unquote statistic that a typical youth minister lasts about 18 months in a church and then they move on to something else. Right. I have not found one single study in my life that that is based on, but that's just, we've used the word statistic because it's what we see. It's like right. anecdotal, you know? And similarly in, in marriage and family therapy, the commonly cited quote unquote statistic is that couples that go to therapy for their marriage wait six years too late yeah. to go to therapy. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's too late in the sense that it'll never be good again. It just means that they really could have benefited from being way more proactive on the front end. That's right. Um, and I think that's true for, for individuals, for couples, for families to to kind of um, to, to work with someone who can help assess patterns, identify weaknesses or just blind spots early on to avoid some of the really difficult ruts that we can get into individually, relationally, all those things. That's right. So, and what's the phrase, you know, an ounce of prevention, prevention is, is worth a, a pound of cure or however that, yeah, right. that goes. And, right. and that's, that's very much what, what started to shift for me. Yeah. In fact, this morning I, I met with my, my therapist and it's just a, a regular part of, of my every 
everyday life now. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. So I'm curious about, I guess, bringing those two worlds together then. So you've got this this beautiful family, this beautiful mission that God has called you to with all of the difficulties and even ambiguity that comes with fostering of uncovering your role in this, what is God calling me to for this particular child in this particular circumstance. And in the midst of that, maybe learning more and more the three-dimensional nature of people's mental, spiritual needs, just how, how they're developing as a human person and all the different things that influence them from their their birth and their upbringing, early childhood to, to when they were in your home, things like that. Um, when did you start to see um, some of the ways that there were um, mental health, spiritual health needs in the children that were in your home, maybe in particular the the four boys that you mm -hmm. have have joined you forever. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if if someone just any any adoption, and particularly adoptions that 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 come as a result of some traumatic experience, mm -hmm. and in this case. You know, every 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 child in foster care, there's some amount of trauma right. in their background, and for us, even uh, our our youngest uh, kids, um, just the the trauma of, and they were they were you know zero three days to to six months old when they came into our home. So um, even even just the the trauma of separation from birth mom is 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 enough sure and so so there's a there's a trauma background there's a trauma story for for any child who's in foster care and thus any child who's adopted through foster care and that was certainly true uh you know for our boys so that that creates a a a, a unique and particular kind of challenge uh in terms of parenting kids who have experienced trauma and it wasn't that was even though you go through all of the foster care training, mm -hmm. um, nothing can adequately prepare you <laughs> for that. Yeah. Now, what I found was we went through it a second time a couple of years later. And I was like, I felt like I was the expert. I'm like, I get it now. You know, <laughs> I finally understand everything you tried to teach us two years ago. I understand now because I had something to connect it to and experience. It it just doesn't land until you go through it. And right. so um, that's not to fault the training they did as well as they could. But it, it was to say um, until you're in it and you start to see um, some of the challenges we had uh, was the first part of it was related to the attachment cycle. I never understood why it was so important the first three years of, of a child's life uh, when a, not a whole lot's going on. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're, they're just kind of subsisting. They're sleeping, they're eating, they're moving around in space. You know, parents are, are kind of providing for, for all of their needs. And I learned, though, what happens if that's not happening? Hmm. And I, I began to appreciate, you know, this 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 concept of the attachment cycle. And if so it basically goes, you know, a need is expressed. I'm hungry or my diaper is full. Yeah. Um and then so there's a need, then they express the need, and then um most of the time the parent or some caregiver that they trust meets that need mm -hmm. and then the child can relax. Sure. And that happens thousands and thousands of times before, say, you're three years old. Mm -hmm. And that really begins to, to, to shape and to frame how a child sees the world, understands their value and their worth, uh, understands that the world is, is a safe place to be, and that trustworthy you know, parents and caregivers are there, which become kind of a stand-in for future you know, authorities in their life. Right. Well, what if that's disrupted? And in some ways, that's kind of the experience uh, oftentimes for, for kids who have experienced trauma is that that attachment cycle, that, that trusting relationship with caregivers is disrupted. Mm. And then, then that experience gets sort of mapped onto this new family and it becomes really difficult to to work with you know kids whose whose trust in you know in that the world is going to take 
you know, the world's a safe place and that caregivers can be trusted, um, that, that creates a new paradigm. Hmm. And so we took on kind of a spectrum of, of approaches. First, it was, well, we're going to parent, even though we know that they have this trauma background. I don't quite understand that, but we're going to try to parent like we were parented. Sure. Or what we see other good, strong Catholic families be parenting. Sure. And um, so, for instance, we we would try to do that, and our experience was we just failed miserably. It wasn't working. What did that look like? Like, what were some of the approaches that you would collect from your family of origin, from families that you knew? What were some of the practices that, that didn't seem to land? Well, um, I would say, I mean, I think the, the, the first, the, <laughs> I was a pretty compliant kid. So I, that didn't help me any in this case. I mean, <laughs> there was, and this was a, a deficiency perhaps in our, in our family. We were, we were very conflict averse. And so I knew no conflict. I knew no conflict between parent and, and child. Sure. I'd heard about it, you know, <laughs> like my, my friends had this experience of it. It was just never my experience. Yeah. We ne- my, my mom, I never heard her raise her voice in all my years of, of growing up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> true. True. And so that's amazing. I, I didn't even know the monster that was within me <laughs> until I had a defiant child. And I'm like, <laughs> like, who is this guy, you know, yelling and screaming. I didn't even know. And then you, then the shame starts to come, you know, mm-hmm. okay. That whole cycle. But, um, you know, it would just be like, I, I, I would give sort of a, a clear direction of something they needed to do. And just the fact that I, I would speak it clearly and directly and there, and there was no ambiguity. You had no, no wiggle room. You just need to do X. Well, the child uh, has no reason to trust me. They're not so sure about the world and what caregivers bring to the table. Mm-hmm. They've they they're more like survivors themselves trying to take care of themselves because mm-hmm. others their parents in some way shape or form didn't take care of them. Sure. So they have to rely on themselves. So they feel powerless when you tell them something that they need to do. And then so then we started to learn well what can we do to empower a powerless child. Mm. And we need them to go to bed or we need them to eat or we need them to brush their teeth. You know, uh, you can brush your teeth uh, before or after uh, we read a book. What would you like to do? Yeah. Let's do it before. Great. Yeah. You know, let's do it after. Great. You know, <laughs> so versus brush your teeth. Yeah. And so now uh, we're in a battle. And for me, my mom would have told me, brush my teeth. I would have gone and brushed my teeth. Mm-hmm. And I thought that's how it worked. Sure. And that's a silly example, but that's that's indicative of... Oh, this isn't just just straight and direct, and even though and unambiguous, it's full of color and complexity and emotional potential emotional dysregulation. Just because I'm asking you to brush your teeth, right? And then you get even more upset because I'm just asking you to brush your teeth, you know, <laughs> or I'm just asking you to take this medicine. You're telling me that you're sick but you don't want to take the medicine, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, whatever it might be. And then, so you start pulling your hair out because all of these normal, for me, quote unquote, normal ways sure. of, of parenting, you know, uh, weren't working. And this was happening all over the place. Mm. And so uh, we had to, to really take a full step back and understand what trauma means and how to, in a sense, work with it versus work against it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What did that process look like then of coming to understand trauma in a deeper way, a deeper, mm-hmm. deeper knowledge of what that, what that means, what it might look like in the lives of people in general, but especially the people that live in your home. Mm-hmm. And then um, coming to an understanding of, okay, if someone is living with this undergirding reality in their life, if this is, if this is the way they see the world then how can I parent in that kind of framework? What, what did that process yeah. look like for you? Yeah, and I think probably the, the, the biggest thing that started to happen was, you know, um, all, all good parents have, have a sense of in, imparting the truth that actions are connected to consequences, sure. right? Um, and, you know, good parents are able to help 
connect that reality for their for their kids. If you make this choice, here's here's the consequence. Um, but what we what for, so for instance, but for us, we couldn't. We had to kind of go beyond <laughs> beyond consequences. The 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 concern of of say if you do this. You'll ha- we had this funny thing where we were like, okay, we need short, time-bound consequences that that uh, can be positive. <laughs> and so we came up with this idea that um, if if a child does something wrong or they misbehave, uh, they get a ten-minute chore. I'm like, oh, that's right. brilliant. You know, yeah, oh. they don't. They don't want to go sweep right now, and and but we're going to make them sweep, and they'll sweep, and they'll learn next time. I don't want that ten minute chore. It's 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 right now. It's actionable. It's you know, it's all of these. It's productive. Whatever mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they can learn, <laughs> you can learn industriousness, right. hard work, <laughs> and you know the house is cleaner. <laughs> well, at one point, um, those consequences started adding up. And now, now you've got three 10 minute consequences. Now you've got 15 10 minute consequences. For one of our children, we got to 187 10 minute consequences. And like Jill and I pull each other aside and we're like, this isn't working. <laughs> this is not working. The consequences right now just don't compute. And so we had to rethink. We had to rethink, like, what are we doing? And so rather than taking a consequence, like punishment, consequence paradigm, we focused on relationship mm. and we focused on, on trying to, to actually understand and empathize with, with what they were experiencing. We tried to empower by kind of na- naming, naming the pain that, that they're experiencing and and then giving them choices, even saying things like, "What do you think should be a good consequence for for that action?" Sure, you know. Sure. And surprisingly, they're often harder on themselves than we would have, been, <laughs> which is interesting. Like it yeah. should be all this. Like, well, well, okay, you know. <laughs> but 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 bringing them into into the experience of learning versus just sort of imputing the this onto them bringing that bringing them into it and while i i don't think this paradigm i don't necessarily think a, a, a trauma-informed perspective of parenting would would work in all circumstances i think it's really meant to meet the particular challenges and hurts and pain that someone who has experienced usually usually from an authority or a caregiver and so i'm now i'm standing in that the place of that sure person sure I have to I have to bring that perspective to the table. And the other big thing, and I, I've I've shared a lot about what would be best to help kind of uh, work for a child. There were some things that really needed to change in me mm. before you know, alongside these different changes of you know thinking, seeing parent parenting differently. Um, Trying to empower, trying to still ha- have consequences, but in such a way that that would bring, you know, reconciliation in relationship. Mm-hmm. We didn't do time out anymore. Mm. We did time in. So for a lot of kids who experience trauma, abuse, or neglect, the sense of being banished, <laughs> you know, even for <laughs> thirty minutes or ten minutes, is a sense of rejection, and we didn't want to replay that. Mm. So we would do time in. And you would start by just sitting on the couch together, and and we would pr- uh, prioritize physical touch. And so our legs needed to to touch, and we wouldn't talk, but we would do ten minutes. And then after that ten minutes, they were more regulated, we were regulated, and and we could talk about what happened. Mm. I still have so many fond memories of that natural reconciliation that would happen when you have time to for everybody to kind of de-escalate that physical touch, that sense of time in, you're not pushed away, but I, I want to, I want you close to me. I value you and I'm taking my time. Right. You know, right, and, and right. expressed something, I, I hope. So that was a really, those, those are just a few examples of, of different ways that we, we tried to, to tackle these unique 
uh, perspectives and experiences our kids had. Because what it sounds like is that 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 shift toward relationship started to look at um, maybe getting away from um, some of the idealized expectations about this is what this is what a kid does. I don't know if you've heard child, but a, a good kid does what their dad says, you know, like, let me inform you about what a child does. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, and so getting, and even, you know, for myself and my own parenting as well, I can think through internally thinking like, well, this is what a good dad does and I'm not doing it. So I don't know what's wrong with me either. You know, so yeah. getting outside of that kind of a framework, which as you mentioned, often leads to just a cycle of shame and kind of self condemnation, something like that. Yeah. Right. Um, but getting into a perspective of trying to to maybe ask the question, like, what does my son need in this circumstance, right? Right. It was prioritizing the relationship mm. and, and reconciliation over behavior. Mm. You know, I, I, I spent too much time um, allowing my kid's behavior, whatever it may be, to control my emotions. Mm. And that was the major turning point for me. And in fact, uh, if I, if I could, I could share a little story Please, about yeah. how that happened. Uh, this is the kids are like, you know, nine, uh, or no, like seven, uh, four, three, and two. Our youngest, uh, was in, uh, a car seat, like, you know, like a full car seat. Um, and we're driving a long way down Interstate 35 uh, from Minnesota to Kansas City. My mm -hmm. wife is driving. We're in a minivan. It's dark out. She's going about 70 miles an hour. The context was I was listening to a talk, like a uh, Christian talk on anger. So just note that. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, my wife has to stop quickly. Something something happened, like there was a, a wreck or I don't know, but she had, to, she had to push the brakes pretty hard. Well, my youngest kind of went flying and he was in a car seat, but he went, the car seat went flying. Okay. And I'm not going to name names, but uh, one of his brothers uh, decided it would be funny. At some point, this is going to happen. I'm going to unbuckle his car seat oh. because something's going to, when it, when it comes time to stop, we're going to see what happens. <laughs> and uh. I don't know if, if there's anybody out there who has unbuckled, you know, them themselves from the front seat and decided to go enact justice while the car is still <laughs> driving. You know, I'm like stomping back to the back and like, rah, just, just yelling and so mad and so angry. And I take a deep breath and I, I get all that anger out and I go and sit back down in the front seat. And in the quiet, I hear that talk on anger discontinuing. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear I've never been converted by irony before or since. But the, the it's not I, a common tool in God's it, belt, but it's but occasional. He, <laughs> but he, he wielded it beautifully that night. I, and I was broken into, just mm. broken into for who I was becoming, who I didn't want to become, what I didn't want to be true of my relationship with my boys. And... um that next morning, uh, I'll never forget my prayer time and the Lord just saying to me, um, you are my son. You are not the sum of your kids' behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I started to believe that. I think I had be believed that, that I was, my kids were my legacy, were, would tell the world who I am. And when they would misbehave, what story is that telling the world about me? Well, that's just not true. Yeah. That's not the truth of, of who I am. And I remember going to confession, just this earnest confession the next day, and something was healed in me of, of that angry dad left. Hmm. Now, there's still anger, but the angry dad <laughs> died that day. Hmm. And um, I am so grateful for that moment of, of irony. And, and I, I have reconciled with my kids so many times, and I, I know I reconciled with my son after that. What I did was wrong. Um, please forgive me. I, I, I don't want to do that again. And mm -hmm. I'm going to work hard not to. And asking for forgiveness, you know. Mm. That's really um, convicting for me. So thank you for that. It's very um, encouraging, consoling, but convicting in a good way mm -hmm. as well, because... 
I, I joke about it all the time in the sense that I'm not really joking when I say that I, I wasn't an angry person until I had kids. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, they just right. brought anger like, into my life. I was like, yeah. I was fine until you got here. <laughs> <Exactly>. Like, what? <laughs> exactly. Well, as we as we look toward wrapping up, I've got one more kind of curiosity question. Um, more for the folks okay. out there who are either maybe they're fostering or have adopted themselves. Maybe they're somewhere in the process of adoption, but they haven't been able to fully adopt yet. Maybe there are couples or individuals out there who just have it on their heart to be a foster or adoptive parent at some point down the road. Are there any kinds of uh, wisdom or um, tips that you would offer that you maybe would have given yourself 20 years ago? Yeah, I would, I would say, I mean, for me, the biggest thing that we lacked, uh, particularly in the early years was a team of people who were dedicated to, to supporting and and serving us, if Mm. you will. Um, Every foster family needs a circle of support around them. So not everybody is going to be called to to be a foster parent. Uh, some might be just doing respite care, you know, occasional nights or two nights for a foster child, or they they become foster parents. Or others might not be called to either one of those things, but they'd be willing to be a part of a circle of support. Sure, we that has become much more a standard practice for licensed foster parents. It certainly is here in the Twin Cities. And so I'm a, I'm a circle of support member for another foster family. And, mm-hmm. that, and I, I do a check-in with them every month, you know, and I've been doing that for you know, six, seven years now. And so that's, that was the number one thing we missed out on. But the other thing um, to know, like it's, it's hard. It's just hard. Yeah. And you have to, it's sort of like, you know, when you come to serve the Lord, Sirach to, you know, prepare yourself for an ordeal. Right. Um, that's true. That's true in foster care. And and it's, it, I don't think I understood that. I really didn't. Mm. And it happened quickly. And it, and we went from zero to, to four kids in about 18 months. <laughs> Funny story with my, oh. with the, our youngest, uh, we went, Jill, we had three kids and Jill's like, Hey, could we, could we pray about maybe a fourth foster, you know, a fourth kid. I'm like, I guess, you know, and we're like, so we, <laughs> go we to, have to, <laughs> <laughs> we go to Olive Garden and we're eating all the breadsticks and salad and, and, and we're like, okay, we're going to pray, you know, let's take a week, you know, just a week. All right. All right. Okay. We're going to pray. Well, that's Sunday and Wednesday comes along and I come home and I walk through the living room and there's a little car seat right there. And I'm like, who is that? I don't know who that child is, but it <laughs> happened quick. And I went to the back in the bedroom and she goes, Ryan, I'm so sorry. I tried to call you, but you didn't pick up your phone. I couldn't say no. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. And that's my my youngest son, Adam, who I just love, love dearly. But it was like, things were happening. Surprise. You know, yep. Surprise. <laughs> uh, we've got a new son. And we oh, did. Gosh. So you just, there's just, a, it's a wild, a wild and wonderful call. And I think we're participating as Christians in, um, in a, in a, in a certain reflect, uh, uh, this adopt, this hospitality of adoption, hmm. this hospitality of welcoming the stranger, um, is what foster care and adoption participates in. And um, and I my conviction, just on one level, just to take foster care, it is a solve, I'll put it this way, it's a solvable humanitarian crisis. Mm. And the reason I say that is because there's a number. Like when I say fix poverty, I, I can't even put my number on how do you fix poverty. Sure. But I can put a number on the number of kids in foster care in the United States. And I firmly believe that there are more happy, healthy, holy families mm-hmm. uh, than in, in the United States than there are kids who need them. Sure. And so I look at it like that. It's, it's a solvable humanitarian crisis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, <laughs> not easy. Yeah. Uh, so painful and difficult. And it's not just, we don't just need foster families or adoptive families. We need all the spectrum of support. Right. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of beautiful things over the years, like churches and a lot more in kind of evangelical Protestant settings where they that church, they commit that all the foster kids in this county, we're going to make sure there's zero. 
Wow. And it's beautiful and they do it. Yeah. And you can do that like county by county. Hmm. And I think, you know, there are uh, like the Archdiocese of Kansas City, Kansas has this conviction. I've spoken to to the archbishop there and um, he has this conviction. And Hmm. it's beautiful to see the church see that there's an incredible opportunity because one of the most important resources we have are the are these beautiful families. And why I actually think foster care is better for a big Catholic family versus just us who who couldn't have kids sure. is because kids from traumatic backgrounds um, can can kind of find their place in a strong family culture. Mm. Mm. And unfortunately, we had a, a, a family culture that wasn't defined by the, you know, sort of happy, healthy, holy. Um, it was defined by trauma. Sure. And so I actually think I'd love to see more big families consider the gift of their family culture to a child who would really benefit from it. Hmm. Because they can just kind of get absorbed, not making it sound too easy, but they can get kind of absorbed into this way of life. Hmm. Whereas we had kind of trauma was what kind of created our culture. And that had had some negative effects on, on, on me, on... Uh, you know, all the boys, you know, it kind of becomes this trauma household. Hmm. And so that that's the other way I would think about it a little bit differently is, and now we couldn't have kids, so that wasn't really our choice. But but I think a lot of times families who, who, who do have uh, some children or a bunch of children kind of tap out sure. uh, instead of realizing that they have an incredible uh, game-changing re- resource and gift that they could perhaps give for, for the sake of others. Absolutely. I, I love your approach to your life for a lot of reasons, but the way that you're able to be um, honest and also very hopeful about the reality of fostering and adoption is one of my favorite things about the way that you communicate about it, because it it would be, you know, I'm sure you know even better than I do, it would certainly be a disservice to to glorify the reality of fostering and adoption more than anything else in the mm. world. Marriage can be glorified before you get into it right. if you don't know what it's going to be right. like. Um, so so being real about the challenge and the struggle so that people don't feel like there's been a bait and switch of what's going on here, but also being even more abundantly clear about the great graces and blessings and gift that fostering and adoption is to everyone in the system. You know, God willing, yeah. fostering is a great gift to the birth family. And there can be reunification there. Certainly, God willing, a gift to the child and a gift to the foster family. And if adoption is a part of the process, an even beautiful gift that way. Just I I love that that both and of it's really, really hard. And it's this amazing gift that you'll never regret. You know? Well, and that's what happened one Father's Day some years back. The kids were going nuts and I just wanted a peaceful breakfast on Father's Day, right? Is, there, is that too much to ask? <laughs> right. And I'm going to guess apparently so. It went on to, but it went it to like 11, you know, <laughs> and I was just so mad and so angry, so discouraged. And I, I just stomped away, left the table, abandoned, abandoned the breakfast. <laughs> and I went into my room and I just cried. Hmm. And I had this sense of regret and I, I I entertained this thought of like I I regret doing this, mm. and um, but very quickly the Lord placed the word gift into my mind and heart, and my first thought naturally was sort of like yeah I know I'm I'm a gift to these kids where would they be you know without <laughs> me, <laughs> and the Lord's like no 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about that kind of gift they are my gift. To you, and holy moly, um, <laughs> has that been the truth? Hmm. Um, they, the Lord has, in His providence, allowed the difficulties and all of that in my life and their life, in some part, ho- hopefully, to bring redemption in their life, but certain redemption in my life. Hmm that I'm not sure how else the Lord, he's sovereign and providential, can do whatever he wants, but this was his way of bringing redemption and transformation to to me. And uh, that was a really powerful Father's Day, even though it started off in ways that I wasn't too happy with. (laughs) Which is uh, 
a beautiful way to to close by going back to the way we started with you reflecting on journeying with your stepdad in his final days as well. That yeah. in the midst of his very difficult circumstances, you were given the gift of caretaking and caregiving and of serving and that you received so much through these really difficult circumstances. And I, I love that perspective that in the midst of the hardship of uh, trauma backgrounds and parenting that's informed by trauma and how to how to navigate all these really difficult, complex relationships that in the midst of all that, that you are the one who's received multitudes of gifts over the course of the years. Unreal. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's been, that's been, and so I, I, people do say that at times, you know, boy, I'm, I'm, where would those kids be? And I think, honestly, I don't know, but I'm not sure where I'd be. Hmm. And, uh, so I don't, I don't necessarily correct them when they say that, but I, I think it isn't, it isn't just that simple. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm really grateful for, for the way the, the Lord, brought that little lesson in that day. And it's been an important perspective. I love that. I love that. Well, we close every episode with a little challenge by choice, some kind of a possible, like actionable uh, uh, challenge by choice, just the way it sounds for mm -hmm. our good listener out there, you listening right now, to put into action something from this episode. And you, Ryan, had come up with the great challenge by choice of um, taking one single step to just raise your hand and to identify yourself to the people around you as, and saying, I need help mm. in whatever the way that may be, you know? Yeah. And um, for some people, maybe that's doing the the very difficult thing that you and I have both done, which is raise your hand to a therapist and <laughs> go to their website and say, I need help. And right. when can you meet? Things like that. Maybe it's meeting with a therapist. Maybe it's um, having a really difficult conversation with your spouse that you have needed to have for years and just going to them and saying, I need help because I need us to be better connected than we are right now. You know, maybe it's uh, connecting with a, a, an accountability group like you were talking about before of going to a group of men or a group of women and saying, um, I need things that I can't provide for myself. I need the support and the care and the knowledge of other men or women in my life. So I, I need your friendship and your companionship on this journey. And maybe... Um, uh, Kenna had brought up the the simple situation of maybe just going to your family if you're in need and saying, I need help. I just need a nap. So can you just give me an hour to, to like take a break in the afternoon and go take a nap? Nothing extreme. I just need some sleep, right? Yeah. That's it. Like whatever degree that help looks like, having the courage and the humility, maybe most of all, to acknowledge right. my my poverty in the good sense. Like I have needs that aren't being met. And having the courage to go out and pursue the resources that can help meet those needs. I think yeah. that's a great, great challenge. I, I love, love it. We would always say my wife and I had helped us as we were working with our boys to remind them that we are limited resources. You know, we, we want to be as generous as we can, but we we run out. You know, our ta our tanks run dry, and and I think that's just such a helpful place to be, just to just to acknowledge wherever it may be. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, why don't we pray, Ryan, to wrap up, and then uh, we can get you on your way back to your loving family, and uh, back to where God's called you. Hmm? Sounds great. <sighs> loving God, you are our Father, and you are a good Father. You um, you lead us in your goodness and your grace, and you. Show us your love in big and small ways every day. So we ask for your blessing on us today, Lord, that we might find our true identity, our true value as your precious sons and daughters. We pray for all of those in any relationship with foster care or adoption in any way. Um, we pray for families and parents who are fostering. We pray for children who are in need of uh, foster care for any reason. We pray for birth families who are going through hardship, difficulty, pain, suffering um, for their well-being and healing. We pray for birth parents, for adoptive parents, for children who are in need of um, being adopted or finding a loving home. Um, we pray also, Lord, for those who you might be calling to um, the beautiful role of fostering or adoption today, right now. Um, those that feel the tug on their hearts to give and to, to receive in this way that you might give them um, whatever graces they need to pursue that and to listen to your voice in their lives. And Lord, we pray that we all might be people of 
hospitality, of healing, that we might be people who are willing to support others in their call to serve and to, to give in their family life, and that we might also be able to identify the needs that we have and ask for support from you, first of all, and from the people that you've put in our lives, Lord. And we ask all this, Jesus, as always, in your holy name. Mm. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ryan O'Hara, it's been a gift and a grace. How can people connect with you, track you down, find you out in the world? Yeah. Um, well, I have a website, ryanohara.org. Um, actually, just started a podcast of which you were on. On uh, one developing, of my favorite ones. Developing, delivering uh, great Catholic talks called Better Preach. So The that's podcast, kind of... too. Not just that episode, but the podcast. One of my favorite podcasts. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So that's uh, something that I'm doing in the world. Uh, but if people wanted to connect uh, like over Instagram at Ryan C. O'Hara or at Better Preach. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's a grace, man. It's a grace to call you friend. It's a grace to have you as a guest on this whole life. And uh, we'll look forward to it. And you guys, are, you guys are doing fantastic work. It's so needed. And you and Kenna are positioned so perfectly uh, to bring it to the church. So I'm so grateful too. God willing. God willing. Thank you, brother. To you listening out there, God bless you. And we will see you next time. This Whole Life is a production of the Martin Center for Integration. Visit us online at thiswholelifepodcast.com. It's like burned into my prefrontal cortex now of like... If you do nothing else, if you don't even book the guest, right. you still hit record. <laughs> Just book Doesn't record matter. somewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah.